Welcome back to Key Concepts for Sterility and Sterility Assurance. Okay, so first of all, what is sterility? Well, sterility is the condition of freedom from viable microorganisms. So it doesn't mean that a um, given device or liquid doesn't contain dead microorganisms or microbial byproducts and toxins may well be present. A sterile item is one that's been freed from all viable microorganisms. In practice, there is no definitive test to demonstrate absolute sterility. So we cannot prove sterility without current technological limitations. We can only talk about something being sterile in terms of probability. So we can give ourselves a comfort factor that there might only be a one in a million chance that something is not sterile. Sterilization is the inactivation or the removal of microorganisms. So for example, moist heat sterilization is a sterilization process that inactivates and destroys microorganisms, whereas filtration is a method that removes microorganisms. Both of them end up with the same sterile product, but they do so in different ways. By microorganisms, generally we're referring here to bacteria and fungi. We can also extend that definition to viruses, but we need to uh, be sure that we're talking about viruses when we talk about the concept of sterilisation. Okay, we're going to move on to an exercise. So what I'd like you to do is to go into groups, um, maybe with two or three people in each group, and I'd like you to consider what are the main methods of sterilisation used in the pharmaceutical industry and some of the applications that they're used for. So if you can go away in groups for about 10 to 15 minutes, then if one person from each group can then feed back to the others, share your ideas, then I'll come back with some of my thoughts and they can be compared. So if the person who's in charge of playing the video, if you could pause the video and I'll be back with you when you've completed the exercise. Welcome back. Well, I hope you enjoyed that exercise and found it interesting and challenging and I hope you've had some good group discussions. What I'd like to do now is to share with you some of my thoughts. Okay, so these are some of the sterilisation methods which I came up with. So in terms of terminal sterilisation, we have uh, examples of filtration and uh, moist heat. Another group of sterilisation methods are aseptic filling. So again, we can have filtration, or we can have um, the filling of products with uh, depyrogenated vials. Then another application is with medical devices, and medical devices are often treated with ethylene oxide or gamma radiation. I'm sure you came up with um, other um, ideas. In terms of uh, types of sterile products, Generally, there's three main types of sterile products that are available on the pharmaceutical marketplace. These are parental products, and that generally refers to products that are administered by injection. Then there are ophthalmic dosage forms, uh, basically eye drops. And then there are aqueous inhalations, essentially things that um, you would breathe in. And there are two main methods of creating a sterile product. Terminal sterilisation, which means that the product in its final container is subject to a sterilisation cycle. Or aseptic filling, which means that you take sterile components and put them together in an aseptic environment, but one that is not necessarily itself sterile. So, terminal sterilisation is naturally preferred by regulators. And this is because we can quantitatively assess terminal sterilisation through a concept called the sterility assurance level. Now, regulators require 
that terminal sterilization is the method of choice. So you have to do terminal sterilization unless you can prove that your product wouldn't survive the process. In which case you can then go on to aseptic filling, but a rationale or justification is required. So sterile, aseptic filling is a greater risk because here you're bringing together a sterile product that you've probably sterilized by filtration, sterile containers that you've probably passed through a deparagination oven, and a sterile rubber closure. And then you're putting all those together and you're trying to keep sterility. And this cannot be quantitatively demonstrated. There's no probability or formula that can be applied to say that an aseptically filled product is sterile. All we can do is ensure that we have good environmental control and that we regularly practice the act of aseptic filling through the use of media and media trials. There's different presentations, so terminally sterilised or aseptically filled products tend to be made in glass ampules, glass vials or as pre-filled syringes. There is an alternative um, method, and that's called blow fill seal, which, is, which straddles the boundary a bit, but should really always be classed as an aseptic filling process. And blow fill seal is really used for the manufacturing of plastic ampules and vials, or putting product into plastic bags. And it reduces the risk somewhat by the bag or vial being, by being sealed within the filling machine itself. In addition to being sterile, products that are marketed as sterile products are also expected to be pyrogen free, which either means they're apyrogenic or at least contain an N-toxin potency below a set safety limit. Such products are also required to be free from visible particulates. Now, sterility is not something that's natural. Okay, so sterility is an unnatural state and it's also something that's transitory, which means that it um, won't in theory last forever. Now for a sterile product to remain sterile, it must be protected from external environmental contamination. That means it needs to be isolated within a container and that container must be impenetrable to microorganisms. But that sterile condition is at risk as soon as the container is breached on purpose. So when the nurse puts a needle into the container to withdraw the solution, at that point it's no longer sterile. Loss of sterility can also occur by accident if a vial is broken or cracked. Now, you remember earlier I discussed the sterility assurance level, which is applied to terminally sterilised products. The benchmark is to achieve something called a sterility assurance level of 1 million. This means that after we've sterilised a product or group of products, there we should have developed a sterilisation method or cycle that means that in theory there should be no more than one chance in one million of an item remaining non-sterile. Now remember that there's no definitive test for sterility, so we're basing all this on a probabilistic concept. And we tend to demonstrate this uh, through the use of biological indicators. And it's interesting also to note that many manufacturers now aim for an overkill sterility assurance level um, where there's no more than a chance of one organism surviving in a million million uh, items. And you can see from the uh, graph on the screen um, that the different factors that affect the sterility assurance level so on the uh, x-axis are the number of survivors that could be after a sterilisation process and on the y-axis is the time taken to achieve our desired level of sterility. 
And the factors that influence this are the number of microorganisms. So the more microorganisms there are, the longer the time taken to achieve sterility. Another factor is the microbial species and its resistance. So some microorganisms are killed off faster than others, others take longer and they're more resistant to destroy. And uh, if you can't make out the chart fully, there's a copy of the chart in the course notes. Okay, moving on to media simulation trials. And this is the way that we assess whether an aseptically filled process is uh, working correctly. And remember, this is only a, a qualification test. We can't uh, quantify this. So what we do for this, we fill media into, into our product vials instead of the product itself. And this is a microbiological growth medium. So it's either tryptone soya broth or vegetable peptone broth. And this is essentially a placebo that's substituted for the product and is processed in a manner exactly the same way that we process the product. Our target is zero contamination. And whilst the media is being filled into vials, it's important that those tasks with running the production line carry out all the interventions, all the normal stoppages, all the normal aspects of the process as they would do for a product film. So we're subjecting this microbial growth media to the greatest risk. And in constructing a media filling trial protocol, there's all manner of factors to consider, such as the type of product being filled, the batch size of the product, the containers used and the closures used, the fill volume, the filling line speed, the way that people act, the filling line configuration, whether we pause the process, how many units to fill, and whether they should actually match the number of product containers filled. The acceptance criteria, which these days really is no contaminated units, how long the media trial is going to last for, the number and types and frequency of interventions. So putting together a media trial protocol is a complex activity and within the course module there's a quite a considerable part of the course text devoted to this important subject. Okay, I'd like to just pause and have a little look at some of the um, major historical incidents that have occurred over the years to show you why sterile product manufacture is of such great importance and the dangers of things that can go wrong. So probably the most famous case of all occurred in 1971. This is called the Devonport Incident. And this is where seven patients became very ill and five died. And this was because they were given an intravenous dextrose fluid in hospital. And the reason that they became ill and some of them died was because this infusion fluid was contaminated with the microorganism Klebsiella orogenes. And the concentration of bacteria in the, in the infusion uh, bottles administered was sufficiently high. And this happened because an autoclave cycle failed and the autoclave cycle record wasn't checked properly. And in essence, they failed to get all of the air out of the autoclave and they had cold spots. And uh, just to illustrate this, this is, this is one of the pictures taken from the course module. Again, apologies, it's not going to be super clear on your screen, but it shows you how an autoclave works and you can go away and study that later. But the key concept is that before an autoclave is run, before it starts to heat up, all of the air must be removed from the autoclave by running a vacuum cycle. Because where you get air pockets, then the uh, moist heat, the steam doesn't penetrate. And it's possible that some items within the autoclave won't be heated to the right temperature and any microorganisms may survive. So I strongly recommend you go and read that section of the text. 
Okay, another incident, uh, this time 1970. And this is very, very similar. This occurred in the USA, and it's better known by the Rocky Mountain incident. And here, 378 patients were infected, and 40 died. And uh, the reactions they had were um, things associated perhaps with meningitis, extreme fever, chills, uh, abdominal cramps, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and even seizures. And the fluids were infected with a range of uh, intrabacteriaceae, and again, it was due to a sterilisation site failure. Another one more recently, this is the Urgent Care Pharmacy from South Carolina in 2002. And this was due to a rare fungal meningitis. And it was due to patients being treated for joint pain, and the, the medicine they were administered with was contaminated. And there's more details about this one in the course notes. And finally, to bring you up to date, we have the New England Compounding Centre, which is located in Boston, USA. And this is a compounding pharmacy. So it took um, vials of somebody's product and attempted to fill those into syringes because there was a market for pre-filled syringes for this steroid, and it was a steroid that um, was used for the treatment of arthritis, and the object was to inject the steroid into the base of the neck, so it went into the spinal cord. Unfortunately, because the autoclave cycle wasn't validated properly, and because there were various clinical deficiencies, um, over 700 people were infected uh, with fungal meningitis, across 20 US states and uh, a high number died. And the actual number, because I've got the latest figures from the US Centers of Disease Control in front of me for June uh, 2013, that number's now actually gone up to, let me check, 55 people. So this was the most recent serious incident and again I've added that into the course notes. Okay, so moving on to a different aspect of sterile product manufacture. We have the subject of pyrogens, endotoxin and depyrogenation. So a pyrogen is a collective term for a whole vast range of substances that when injected into the human body or the body of any animal will cause a variety of symptoms. The most recognisable and potentially the most dangerous is a right increase in the body temperature. And the course notes go into detail about the various biochemical uh, reactions involved. It um, triggered cytokines, uh, which are responsible for the elevated temperature response. And uh, there's aspects to read in the course about that. The most serious pyrogen of all is endotoxin, and that's associated with gram negative bacteria. And endotoxin is a component of the bacterial cell wall. And endotoxin is synonymous with lipopolysaccharide, they're essentially the interchangeable term. Um, and there's one component of this lipopolysaccharide called lipid A, which is pyrogenic. And when the gram-negative bacterial cell undergoes lysis, breaks up for some other reason, endotoxin is released, and if that is sufficiently high, it can trigger a pyrogenic reaction. And the way that that's detected is through the uh, limulus amoebocyte lysate test. It's important to recognise that uh, endotoxicity is not related to viability. Um, you can have a sterile solution with no viable microorganisms, but still have endotoxin present within that solution. Now, within pharmaceutical processing, the main sources of endotoxin is water. And we can't get away from water in pharmaceutical processing because it's our main ingredient for aqueous sterile products. 
We need to use it for the cleaning of product content, equipment and components. It supplies our laundries. Our staff need to use it for hand washing. And it supplies the uh, steam to our autoclaves. And we need it to wash our equipment. So we can't get away from wet equipment or water. We just need to be better at controlling it. Okay, so we're coming up to another exercise. This time I'd like you to consider, on the basis of our discussion about endotoxin and pyrogens, why depyrogenation is important. How do you think depyrogenation differs from sterilisation? What different methods are there of depyrogenation? And how do you think we can actually measure depyrogenation? So again, if you could get into groups of two or three, and if you could spend uh, 10 to 15 minutes discussing this, taking some notes, then if one person from each group can feed back, and how you can exchange those ideas, and then I'll be back with, later with some of my thoughts. So if the person playing the video can now pause it, and I'll be back in a few minutes. Welcome back. So I hope you enjoyed the exercise and considered those, very, those four questions on the screen and you had an interesting discussion. I'd now like to share with you some of my thoughts. Okay, so depyrogenation can be defined as the elimination of all pyrogenic substances, including bacterial endotoxin. And it can either be done by the uh, removal of pyrogens or the inactivation of pyrogens. And just to reiterate what I said earlier, sterilization destroys microorganisms, whereas a depyrogenation process sterilizes and removes the microbial byproducts that can be classed as pyrogens. So some examples of different ways of depyrogenating, we have ultrafiltration. So ultrafiltration is used for depyrogenating liquids. So it excludes endotoxin by molecular weight. So we pass the fluid through an ultrafine filter and the ultrafine filter blocks molecules of a weight of 10,000 Daltons or greater, which coincides with the endotoxin molecule. So ultrafiltration is designed to remove endotoxin. We also have reverse osmosis, which is very similar. It's a size excluding filter, which operates under a highly pressurized condition. And again, it's designed to exclude endotoxin from water. Then another way we have is affinity chromatography. And because endotoxin has a negative charge, the um, material uh, within the chromatography column, the particular gel, is designed to attract endotoxin and allow the fluid to pass through. Other ways to reduce endotoxin are by dilution. We can dilute and dilute and dilute and dilute out the endotoxin. Then there's distillation, which is used to make it water for injection. And then we have dry heat, 